pleasure to be with you this morning and to share about a very important topic about evolution and creation and the authority of the Word of God. First of all, there is no inhibition. Any question is allowed. You can disagree with me 100% and I'd like really a very hot debate so we can settle this thing once and for all. Um, first thing, I'd like just to start with this little story about an atheist who doesn't believe in God speaking to a Christian and saying, you Christians have a problem because you think that God took nothing and created the universe. This is illogical. So the Christian said to the atheist, you atheists have even a bigger problem because you believe that nothing took nothing and created the universe. <laughs> so it is more logical to believe in a creator God who created all things for us. Okay, so our topic, the first session, is creation and evolution. And we need to discuss all the things about evolution first, and then I'll take you to the Bible. I want to start with this slide. In the beginning, there was nothing, and nothing had except the idea of the statement. This is really effectively what the evolution starts saying. They say the Big Bang started with nothing. From where did we get the material and the energy? For something to explode, you need two factors. You need matter and you need energy. From where we got this matter and energy? So this took a very silly statement, really. In the beginning, there was nothing. And nothing had exploded to create the universe. That's completely illogical, actually. And we'll follow the evidence as we go along. So we need to evaluate the evidence. And we will listen to the evolutionists first and see what we are proposing. And I'd like to take you to this wonderful verse that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica and he said, test everything. Paul, so we're going to test everything. Nothing is prohibited in this discussion. So please fire at me, because that's what I like. So we test everything, and then we will hold to the truth, as Abuna was saying earlier on. Uh, evolution teaches that life began by a random collision of enough atoms to form complex molecules that produced accurate copies of themselves. Plane, they say that life began by some atoms colliding together. And these atoms formed molecules, and molecules formed amino acids, and <coughs> amino acids formed proteins, and proteins formed cells, and cells started to be living and multiply copying itself. Can you see how much assumptions has been produced in this, in this equation? It's really unbelievable. So they said that these random atoms, without any controlling force or intelligent design to bring them together, they just got themselves together. Is that science? Is that logic? By the way, Science is when you do that experiment under certain conditions anywhere in the world and you get the same results. Nobody can say this is science at all. But that's what the illusions propose. The key to this molecule to human evolution was something called mutation. And mutation is an error. So when you have a photocopier and you have a, a document to photocopy, you can only photocopy to the same quality of the first copy, but you cannot really improve it. You can reduce it actually, but you cannot improve it. So, they say these molecules came together, start to multiply, and they form this mutation. And mutation, as I said, is genetic error. And with these genetic errors, natural selections come in. And the natural selection selects which is more suitable for survival and keeps it on. Again, natural selection doesn't create. Natural selection selects from what's available. So if you're starting with dead atoms and selecting from them, you can't select life out of that. You need a creator of life. You need the source of life who is God the creator. <coughs> we'll come to mutations in our talk in different times. But let me take you to the natural selection. The natural selection is Selection of favorable mutations that alter the animal or plant so that they are more adapted to survive. Selection, they say, if the weather is so cold 
these animals form more fur in their in skin so they can survive. We'll talk about the genetics of how animals are different from one part of the world to another because God created a genetic variety that can adapt to different situations. But natural selection itself cannot create. It selects, that's the word, it selects from what's available. So if you start with dead atoms, you cannot create life and you cannot select life. So these are the two main pillars really of the evolution theory, mutation and natural selection. And by the way, the uh, evolution theory was not just by Darwin, it was there from the Greek time. It's a very old theory. Darwin made it into this book of Origin of Species. And next year will be celebration of 200 years of the birth of Darwin and 150 years for the Origin of Species, this book. So there will be lots of debates about this. And I'm delighted that we are sitting now and discussing this very important issue with very open mind, as I said. But this is what they are proposing. This is not science. This is assumptions. And assumptions which are not really solid enough. The cell can come only from a functioning cell and cannot be built up piecemeal because the major organelles must have been created and assembled at the same time in the cell exists. The cell is a very complex structure. It has a nucleus and it has something called cytoplasm and it has a cell membrane which has to live with the environment and adjust the sodium and potassium and all the elements around it. It's a very complicated system. In the cytoplasm, you have something called mitochondria, which is responsible for the breathing of the cell and creating the energy and forming something called ATP to allow energy to be released and function in the cell. So, for a cell to function, all these elements have to come together. You can't wait for the cell membrane to form and then the cytoplasm after 100 years will come and the nucleus will come after 1000 years to allow it to function. This is not science. This is not biology. And if I take you to the details of the cell, it is really amazing. The most complicated computer cannot be compared to a functioning cell. And how many trillions of cells do we have? And in order for all of that to function, you need a brain. So, for my body to function, I need my kidney, and I need my liver, and I need my stomach, and I need my circulation, and I need my nervous system. I need all of that at the same time. I can't wait to function with two kidneys and waiting for the heart to pump after 100 years, or after 1,000 years, after many years. That's not biology. That is not science. To exist as a living organism, the human body has to be created fully formed. We need everything to function at the same time. Because, as I said, you cannot wait for one organ to develop and waiting for another to come after a few years, as the evolution say, thousands of years and millions of years. Many researchers have concluded that the probability of life arising by chance is so remote that we have to label it as impossibility. So this is uh, from science books, actually, these quotations. And they calculated that the chance of life happening by chance is very, very remote to the extent that we can consider that as an impossible position. And I'll take you through some figures probably in this session or the next session to give you some equations to tell you that this probability is nearly zero. Okay? There is not a shred of objective evidence. We are following the evidence as I said. There is no shred of, shred of um, objective evidence to support that, that hypothesis that life began in an organic soup here on Earth. I start. believe that some soup, water, and some elements. And this collided together, formed molecules, formed amino acids, formed proteins, formed cells, cells start to multiply. There is no evidence of that at all. And when you see something like Dawkin in his writing, he said, life didn't start on Earth, it starts on another planet. And he said a very, very interesting statement. He said, if it starts on another planet, I'm sure it starts by evolution there. This is not science. He's asserting something based on assumption. 
There is no science. That's the, the first thing we need really to establish in our day to day. Mutation observed on molecular level, such as DNA, and we come to a whole section about DNA, are predominantly disruptive and always with lots of information and complex code. When there are some mutations, these mutations actually are error of the copying of the genes. So they are usually disruptive and unfavorable. You might come as a question, why do we have vaccination every year and it's changing from one to another because the bacteria change? Yes, the bacteria change and the resistance change to antibiotics. But you know that the change to resistance to antibiotics is due to loss of information. It is a favorable change for the survival of bacteria and against man, but it is due to loss of information, not an added information. And that's very important, because the big question will come from where information came. You have to have a source of information. Look at the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. In the beginning was God, and God created. That makes sense. That's logical, because you need a source of life, a source of information. Let us see some statistics here. The average human has about 75 trillion cells. I don't know how we can manage this trillion. But 75 trillion cells. The cell itself is far more complicated than the most complex machine ever manufactured. That's just the magnitude of who we are now. When you are sitting here, you have 75 trillion cells. They are different. The cardiac muscle is different from the nervous system, is different from the absorptive power of your stomach and the gut, is different from the skin, is <coughs> different from your hair, is different from the retina, is different from your eye, it's different from the tears that lubricate the eye all the time. Can you imagine all of that just happened by chance? Just molecules collided together, forming atoms, uh, forming cells, and cells are like this. That is impossible scientifically. Statistics about the human body. Just to, to remind you who you are. We have 206 bones in my brain and 108 bones. They are accurate because there is a bone here called the sternum. And it's formed of three parts. Manubrium, sternae, and the body, and the zephyx. Right? So some anatomists conclude that as one bone and others conclude that three separate pieces. So you might have 206 or 208 and both are right. If you think about the bones and joints, for me to stand here, I need my hips. And the, the joint is, is very interesting because it's like a cup and the bone is inside. There is an angle and if this angle is not correct, I wouldn't be able to walk. I would be able to stand. Imagine the chances of this bone called femur here, which is the thigh bone, trying to adjust itself to this socket. Imagine the socket is there. I don't know how it came, according to the evolutionist. And this bone is starting to adjust itself up and down, right and left, in three dimensions, to get right. And then the muscles will start to develop. And attach this bone to another joint. And the blood vessels come and supply this. And the nervous system control all of that and coordinate all of this together. Can you imagine that's going to happen by chance? This is not proven scientifically. That's the first thing that might really to stress so we can progress our discussion. So we have 206 bones. We have 600 muscles. Imagine the muscles that control the eye. They are very interesting muscles, and the way they are inserted, some are oblique, some are straight. To keep adjusting your eye and focusing all the time to see things. There are lots of energy in this, and lots of coordination, and it needs the brain to coordinate all of that. Can you imagine that's developing by evolution over millions of years, cells coming together, bumping each other, forming molecules, forming cells, forming nervous system to do all that. That is beyond belief really. That's beyond logic. 
but that's what the evolutions are saying. We have 10,000 auditory nerves. <coughs> to hear me, that means, and for me to hear you, we need 10,000 nerves from our ears here and going to the brain so they can interpret what I am saying and you can collect all of that and understand it and react to it in momentary seconds. All that's coming by evolution, atoms pump it together, impossible. Two million optic nerve fibers. So, right? You need two million wires, if you like, to connect from your eye to see things and see different colors and to. After that, it goes to the brain and the brain reminds you, also, you reminds you of the meaning of this picture. Like, if you see a friend you haven't seen for ten years, oh, quickly you will start recognizing this person. How can you do that? It is because we have two million optic nerve fibers working to achieve that. Hundred billion nerve cells, and the nervous system is a very complicated system, and there are junctions in between, and these junctions are called synapses, and there are <coughs> small chemicals that is released when need be, and these chemicals stimulate the next set and goes for the next set, and can control and take all of that out, and that's where the drugs work, usually in these synapses and things. Can you imagine that's happening by molecules pumped into each other? Impossible. 400 billion feet blood vessels. It's rich the blood vessels that we have, because the blood vessels are coming from the heart, called arteries, and then the arteries goes to arterioles, and arterioles goes to capillaries. And the capillary is where the blood really filtrates and sends the energy out and get the, uh, giving the nutrients, I mean, and taking all the waste products going back to veins. And the veins start by venules and veins. And the big veins go to the heart, pump the game, going to the lung, oxygenated and recirculating. If you stretch all these wires, especially the capillaries, the capillaries are amazing structure. And not of all, all of them are open at the same time, they open in tubes. Because if they are open all the same time, the 5 liters of circulation will be sucked into it. And as a result, we'll have a shock, something called anaphylactic shock. Because all these floods were open once. So they are open closing, open closing in a harmonious way to keep it functioning. Can you think that this happened by molecules bumped together? Impossible. <laughs> Genetic drifts or mutations and the shuffling of the gene pool can bring about only minor changes in life. These are variations within Genesis kinds. That's a very important statement. When God created, when God created, He created kinds. And within the kinds there are changes. Yes, that is that's biblical. There is nothing wrong with that. Do you know that the cat and the lion are from the same kind? They are completely different. Different dogs, different horses. You have this very famous picture of the horses in the biology books, and they say this is evolution. Actually, they are all horses. They have different variation within a kind. Yes, because God created the ability in the gene pool to differentiate a little bit within a kind. But there is no cross species mutation. The, the dog cannot be a horse next day or after millions of years. That is never observed and never proven and never happened. And the fossil record does not show that at all. We'll come to the fossil records at some stage in our talk. <coughs> Living cells have by far the most compact information storage retrieval system. We'll come in the next session after we have a break after this. We will come to understand what is this DNA and the amount of information that is put in the DNA are amazing. I will leave that to a DVD which we will watch for a few minutes and discussion later. But this statement just reminds us that the living cell, and it has to be a living cell, it's not molecules coming and pumped together. Living cells 
have by far the most compact information storage retrieval system known. The amount of information that could be stored in a pinhead volume of DNA. Pinhead, imagine, just a small little bit of DNA. Is equivalent information content of a pile of paper back books, 500 times as tall as the distance from the Earth to the Moon, each with a different yet specific content. This as amazing in, in this little cell that you cannot see by eye actually. You have teeth under the microscope. In this cell, I told you there is this, um, a membrane and then cytoplasm and nucleus. In the nucleus, there are genes, and in the genes, there are DNA. In this DNA, there are enough information to fill 500, book, uh, 500 times the distance between Earth and Moon. Can you imagine that in compact one cell? There is no computer equivalent to that. There is nothing compared to this. But that's where God creates His almighty God that we worship. Yeah, this is a nice quotation that I just put it for you. Interestingly, <coughs> lobster eyes are unique in being modeled on a perfect, perfect square with precise geometrical relationship of the units. Lobster, it is just eye of is, is directed in different direction, and that's where you can see underwater. And see what happened. NASA X-ray telescopes copied this design. So for NASA to design a telescope, they looked at what God created in nature, and found this eye of the lobster, and they thought this is a perfect design. Let us copy that. And that's the telescope that NASA sends to, to the outer space. There's a very important topic called irreducible complexity. That means you need all the parts together, otherwise none of them will function. All of them will be useless. The presence of complexity interdependent parts that do not function unless other parts are also present poses another major problem for them. The solutions cannot explain how I can wait, as I said, for my heart to pump while my kidney is developing and my liver is metabolizing a little bit but not fully. There is another thing like the blood clotting mechanism. When I cut my hand here, the blood clots. And without it, I will lose blood till I die. And a condition called hemophilia and others can do that. There are 13 factors that needing to be present for this clotting mechanism to happen to form something called fibrinogen into fibrin. And you need the 13 elements together. You can't wait for them to develop over millions of years. So if an animal doesn't have them and hurt himself, <coughs> injured himself, the result they will bleed to death. And, and they will, cannot continue survival and they cannot continue to have any more life. Look how important this issue. If you read any evolutionist books, and I read few, they come to the irreducible complexity and they don't have an answer for that at all. At all. Richard Dawkins and all these great men cannot explain how the reducible complexity, complexity fits in with evolution theory. In the eye and brain, nothing works until all the necessary components are present to work together. So if they are not there, they will never work together. In the retina, there are 100 million light-sensitive cells that send the information to the brain through some 1 million nerve fibers of the optic The retina, which receives the light, there are this huge number of 100 million cells. And we are talking about the retina, you know the size of the eye? It's, it's very small, really. And the size of the retina is not the size of my palm. It's very, very small area here. In this area, there are 100 million sensitive cells. There are something called rods and cones which are able to differentiate between the colors and to differentiate between the lights when you see in dark and in the light, bright light. There are lots of adjustments. Would you expect 
these hundred million cells of the retina to come together by chance? As I said earlier, to ch chance does not create. Chance selects the models available. In order to create, you need power, you need information. Can all the eyes from turmoil of mixed up undirected genes are saying that there is no God, we don't need God, because all the material things can take care of themselves, and they can build themselves together. So, A turmoil of completed floods and floods and floods and floods producing something meaningful. It is impossible that turmoil of, 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 of nature with undirected changes can produce anything useful. The bottom line is that the odds of life evolving from non precursors is essential. That's a right conclusion here. To start from non-living molecules and atoms and to come to life, that is impossible biologically. We haven't touched on the Word of God yet, but we will. Because it's true. We are not here to prove that the Word of God is true, because it is true. But we are here to explain what is an offer from science, or people claim to be scientists. They are not science. Evolution is a faith, a trust of some assumptions, which are illogical. And as I said, I'd like you to fight with me and give me hard questions in a moment. In a moment. Changing even one amino acid in a protein can alter its function dramatically. A famous example of mutation which causes the sickle cell anemia. I'll explain that. It blocks the, although the protein is called amino acids. We have about 20 useful amino acids in our body, but there are about 2,000 amino acids in general. You can produce them in the lab. These amino acids forms protein, and protein is formed of hundreds of times, thousands of amino acids. And they are arranged in a special way, and there are right and left as well. And this arrangement has to be perfect, otherwise diseases will happen. Like the blood cells, we call them red cell corpuscles. Corpuscles is like actually a, a, um, a disc. <coughs> it's not a sphere. It is a disc. And this formation is essential for the blood vessels to go through the vessels really and to go to the tissues and all that. If, and it's formed of protein, if one amino acid is placed wrongly, the shape of this disc would become like a sickle cell, sickle like, like an arrow. If it becomes like an arrow, it starts to crush together and does not able, is not able to carry oxygen and cause this condition called sickle cell anemia, which is a difficult condition to treat. So any change in amino acids is very, very dramatic in the effect that can happen later on. It is caused by replacing an amino acid called glutamine, glutamate, normally at position 6, with another amino acid called valine. The positive so amine is one amino acid changed for another in position 6. Imagine that, how sensitive that is. So one change like this will cause illness and disease. Can you imagine all our body with 75 trillion cells? with lots of protein inside it will come to trillions upon trillions upon trillions because the cells contain lots of proteins and there are, I didn't speak about the hormones coming to operate on the cells that's another big issue and the control of these, all these hormones from a gland called the pituitary gland just below the brain it is impossible, biologically it is impossible this thing change causes a massive distance in how the alpha globin subunit of hemoglobin works. This is and as a result, because of the change of this one amino acid at uh, position 6, it causes this sickle cell anemia. A single organism must have many functional proteins, all of which work together in coordinating hormones coming and that's why you need to hold that. Can you believe that just happened by chance? 
or just collision of atoms. It is impossible biologically. Of course, the word of God is giving up the light because explaining that God created and God created in a wonderful way. Chemical evolution based on random activity of molecules fails to adequately account for the origin of proteins required for even the simplest known free living. That's again just the bottom line of, of what we have been discussing. There is no experiment that can produce, that chemical evolution can produce a functioning cell. This never produced in the lab, cannot be reproduced, cannot be forecasted, because it is impossible. We'll touch on fossilization and uh, be ready for, for any questions because I spoke for too long and uh, we, need, we need interaction. Fossilization. The recent dead or living organism must be rapidly buried in sediment that can harden and exclude oxygen. Fossilization and rapid formation of dead strata must occur rapidly. Because some people think that the fossil rock records have yet, and it's evident that evolution had occurred. It's actually contrary to that. It's proof that God has created and there was a great flood. For fossilization to happen, the dead organism has to be buried very quickly and separated from oxygen. Imagine if a fish dies, they think it stays in the, in the bottom, actually it floats up and then it decays, so it cannot be fossilized. What happens in fossilization? You have to have immediate amount of mud and water to burn living things for dead things, separate them from oxygen and then you have a fossil, a fossil record. And that's what happened with the flood of Noah. Because in the fossil record, you find some animals are, you find a fish eating another fish. fish. So it didn't die for a long time and, and then decayed and then fossilized. It happened acutely and rapidly. That's why we have a fossil record like this. Yeah, this is a nice I would love to have a, a picture to explain this, but um, I'll do that sometime later probably. A dinosaur's neck is sticking to a strata that are allegedly millions of years. Tell me how the dinosaur stayed alive for millions of years with a strata slowing for the a picture here of the, a picture of dinosaur and different strata covering his body and his neck and his head. And they are proposing that these dinosaurs is living, or even if it is dead and not decaying, I don't know how, but assume that it's not decaying. And these strata are forming over millions of years, and millions of years, and millions of years, and millions of years. That's unexplainable at all by physics and biology. Right. No fossil structure transitional between scale and feather is known, and recent investigators are unwilling to found a theory or pure, on pure speculation. The scale is that the animals became feathers later, that's in the evolution theory. There is no fossil structure to show the transition between the scales and the feather. And nobody can explain this function at all. This is pure science. We haven't touched on the word of God yet, but we are not here to prove the word of God as the Buddha was saying. The word of God is truth. Because God is truth. And the pure science is truth. If science is searching for the truth and God is the truth, we should meet. They are not opposing each other. They have to meet. But that's the pure science, not the assumption of human people. Right, we'll stop at that. And um, any questions or any comments, because as I said, I have been speaking for too long and it's difficult to absorb all this information. Yes. Question about the fossilization process. Um, you stated that an animal has to be dead and has to be covered quickly yes. with some sort of form of strata, which fits in quite nicely with the flood. Yes. How do we then explain fossil dating, which goes from hundreds of thousands of years and the flood of only 40 days? Yes. Actually, there is no fossil dated to these thousands of years. <coughs> because if you accept that it is thousands of years, that means dead 
and disease happened before Adam. And that's a fundamental problem. The days of creation, and we can talk about them, in day six, Adam and Eve were created and the creeping animals were created on that same day. So dinosaurs were created on day six. And after the fall of Adam and disobedience, sin entered into the world and with sin came death. So you won't have any record of fossils prior to Adam. And we can talk about the fossils in a big way in our discussions. And that's a big fundamental problem actually. Because lots of people think we have dinosaurs billions of years and then Adam. It's not like that. The biblical record starts by life and then death came. Because in day six when God created Adam and Eve and the animals, he saw everything good. So he didn't see disease and cancer and uh, all this trouble and say that is very good. The, the death and the fossilization happened after the fall. Yes. Yes, you said so. Right. Not proving beyond any shred of doubt yes. that nothing can be created from nothing. Yes. And uh, also we have proven that all these complexities of the universe, the complexity of the anatomy and physiology of the body and everything cannot happen just by chance. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Yes. I don't think any evolutionist can argue at all against any of the facts that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We also prove that all these theories are non-scientific and non-logical. There's no doubt about this. Yeah. But an evolutionist can also use your own argument against you. Yeah. Like saying you created an intelligent creator from nothing. The creator oh, yeah, yeah. has created all these. Uh -huh. A very, very intelligent mm -hmm. creator who created all the anatomy and physiology and yeah. universe and everything. Mm -hmm. But where did that creator himself come from? Exactly. That's the question that they all Wonderful. Even though that we have, they don't have a link to stand on from the, the older evolution field. Yes. But they can use your own argument against you. Mm -hmm. you and I will respond again, I show you. You, can, <laughs> you prove the necessity, the absolute necessity yeah. of having a creator. Exactly. Because nothing could happen yeah. just by chance. Exactly. But where did that creator yeah. came from? Exactly. So the simple way would be who created God? Yeah? Sorry? Who created God? That's what they say. Exactly. Yes, yes. I get this question <coughs> every time I go to schools and I have it from the very clearly. Who created God? Now, the Bible says the ignorant say in his heart that there's no God. Yes. But they don't buy it. I know, I know. We're not buying that just now. Yeah, we will go on their own terms for a bit and bring them to the Word of God. Let me tackle the question of who created God. That's the point of mind, the source of information. If you have a source of information, you can create. Yeah? But who created God? Yeah? Let me explain something about time first. Because the earth rotates around itself to form a day. You all agree? The earth rotates around the sun to form a year. Okay? Because of that, we have yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Because we are part of the solar system. We all agree about that? Great. God lies outside the solar system. So he has no beginning and no end. We are talking about time here. What came before God to give the information? What came before and after? Right? We are measuring our relationship with God here on time scale. Yeah? God lies outside time. So I can't apply the rules of time to a person outside line. Uh, outside time. The way I explain this, I take a, a pen with me like this. What happened when I leave it to draw? The gravity pulled it down. I pick that up again and say, if I take this pen to outer space where there is no gravity and I leave it, it will not fall down. So we can't apply the rules of gravity to an object which outside gravity. We can't apply the rules of time to a person who is outside time. So the answer to your question is, God is outside time. So there is no, no, nobody before him, and nobody after him. 
We have this before and after because we are controlled by the solar system. But God is outside all the solar system and He created the solar system. Is He able to do it? Yes. Is He able to do it in six days? Yes. But we'll come to that. That's a big session itself. Because we sometimes measure the power of God by our ability to perform. So what we achieve in a day, say, oh, God cannot achieve that in a day. He can do it probably an hour, but, but not really creating all of that in six days. I was asked this question by very intelligent students I was talking to. And I was in a school um, in a place called Egyptian, near Eastle Bright, which is very famous of, of uh, um, snow. Yes, thanks. For snow falling. So I, there was lovely fields around the place, and I said to the children, okay, imagine there are snow about two feet high, filling all these fields together. You need about ten men to clear it in about three days. I said, yes. I said, I can do it in half an hour. I said, how? I said, I raised the temperature to 100, and all these things will melt. So we, we sometimes try to think that God cannot create things because we are measuring by a one method of thinking to say, yeah, we can achieve that in a year, in a day, in a month. God is overruling time because he's outside time. So that's the answer to your question because that is addressed in many books. And this is my simple example. You cannot apply the rules of time to a person who is outside time, who created time itself. So there is an answer for evolutionists. If they come back to me, I told you I, I will answer them. Right, any more questions? They are wonderful questions, by the way. Just one comment. Uh, Darwin yes. started all of this in the, in the modern world. Yeah, can everybody hear? Just a comment about Darwin, who, who started all of this in the I think, 19th century or something like that. Darwin was not a biologist. He was not uh, a scientist. Darwin was a theologist. He was studying theology to be a priest. Yes. So I'm amazed on how people followed this man while he didn't have any background in biology. He just built all what he was doing on his observation at an island somewhere in the yeah. South Africa. So this is this amazing. It's like getting a, 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 a financial person who goes to the theaters and watch some uh, doctors doing some operations, and then after two, three years, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm a surgeon and I do operations. Yeah, but actually, uh, in the past, uh, science was not divided as we have it now. Theology and philosophy and science were mixed together. So Mandel, who discovered all the genetic uh, information, or the basics of genetic information, was actually a monk who was uh, uh, planting uh, a cellar and, and noticing the difference in, in different crops and things, and he came to a conclusion. So um, we can consider Darwin as a thinker, and as an observant, and as a theologian, who lost his faith in Washington, and, uh, because of the death of his daughter. But that's, there's a, lo a lovely book about Darwin and how he deviated from understanding God to a person opposing God. And he limited his views to just observations. And he came to one conclusion that when he discovered the mechanism of change, he said, okay, material things can produce material things. But if you take him to the origin, he won't be able to explain life. If you take him to the reducible complexity, there is no chance that he can get it. <coughs> Right, any more questions? Yes, yeah, can I ask? Um, yes, sure. What? Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand still why um, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. Um, why science and religion, why we can't go hand in hand, why can't like, God have created the Big Bang? Yeah, that's good. Well, why God doesn't use evolution to create things? Yeah? That's called theistic evolution. Theistic, theism is God. Theistic evolution. 
many reasons for that. He cannot use that. Because evolution is based on death and life and death and life. And really God created life. And the death came after the fall of man. And the second thing is, that means he is, with, with great respect I'm saying this word, he is a poor designer. Because he didn't get it right the first time. And he wanted to improve it. So he changed and changed and changed slowly <coughs> over years and years and millions of years. This is not the God I worship. This is not the God of the Bible. So, science, actually the pure science doesn't say evolution is established fact. It is a theory. And the Big Bang has many, many, many problems. Massive problems. Okay? And I got DVDs and I met a chap called Lyle in America who is an astrophysicist and I must bring some of his DVDs to watch and see the difficulties of uh, the Big Bang Theory. And there are things that if the creations cannot explain in the universe, yes, I agree about that as well. But that does not mean I should accept what some offer as a theory which is not established fact. I, I like again to differentiate between two words, fact and interpretation of fact. If I say the cow have DNA, and then I say bacteria have DNA, these are facts. But when somebody comes and say, therefore, because they have DNA, they came from common ancestor, is interpreting the facts now. I disagree with his interpretation. So that's the difference between fact and the interpretation of facts. And I think that's very important. So science, pure science, which is pure facts, has nothing to object from God the Creator. But when we interpret these facts from the way we think they are, it's impossible, it's, it's strong. Um, I got, um, yeah, I think it's in the car. Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, can, can, is this a few things here? Yeah, the, yeah. I don't think you'll be able to see this, but, um, right. This just to explain the facts and the interpretation of facts. If I give you these two circles, <coughs> and I say, this is fact at present, can you explain to me what is the origin of this, how this is complete? Can you have some suggestions? This is two semicircles, and I say, give me what is the origin of this? Give me the proposals, that's how this is complete. One circle is split. Right, come and, come and draw it for me. Just, <laughs> no, it's easy. No, it's, it's really interesting. Just, just, yeah. So, what is the origin of this? You are seeing this as a fact now. It was one circle. Right, and that's, good. that's a theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. great. That, that's really wonderful. Because that's a theory, yes. Right, so. It was one circle. No, no, just complete it on here. Right, okay, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Don't clap so much. <laughs> because I'll give you another theory. And I'm glad that you say it is a theory. Because I would say. It was actually quite like this. I would say this is what, what, what it was originally. Can you say I'm wrong and you're right? You can't. I would say, no, it wasn't actually like this at all. It was like this. Can you disagree with me? You can't. So that shows the difference between fact and interpretation of facts. We all started with this fact. These are two semicircles here. We all agree about that. But the interpretation of the origin of this, we have three theories on this piece of paper. Right? So science tells me the fact. But they have to interpret the fact. And the interpretation has many theories. I think that's a very important example. It will help us to understand the difference between what is claimed to be science. But theistic evolution, I read a full book about it, 
and it is not convincing at all. That means God is a poor designer, impossible. And he uses death as a mechanism to produce things. He doesn't do that. My Bible doesn't tell me that. Which I stand in the Word of God is more solid than all the other theories. Yeah? Yes? Finding flaws in a theory necessarily disprove a theory. Yes, it, theory false. exactly. Yeah. Theory is false. That's absolutely fine. It depends on the flaws that's found. There are fundamental ones and superficial ones. If it's fundamental, the theory will collapse. If it is some minute detail, yes, the theory can survive. I agree. But in evolution, there are lots of assumptions. Made man assumptions. Nobody saw these particles coming together. And nobody can produce it in the lab. Because nobody was there at the time of creation. Okay? Or of evolution, or that sense. And nobody can prove the point from molecules to life. They called it the miracle of life. There was a program in Channel 4 um, years and years ago about evolution creation. And then they say, a miracle of life. Life appeared. Thank you. How did it appear? Can you give me a mechanism? They can't. I said to them, God created. Oh no, we don't believe you. So they just argued. So, if there is a theory, if there are fallacies in this theory, yes, we accept that this... Oh, thank you. Everything is available. <laughs> <laughs> just wrote a primitive paper. Thank you. I got actually charged in the car, but I... <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Nadine. Yeah, so, yes, depending on the fallacies. The problem is evolution, the assumptions in the base of, of, of the foundation of evolution, these assumptions are wrong. Because they are assuming, 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 and the assumptions have no science. Yeah? That's very good. Yes? How do you, how do you explain carbon dating? Oh, yes, carbon dating. Carbon dating, actually, let me just explain it first. Um, they consider carbon-14, or carbon dating, as an isotope which loses its half-life. So, in, 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 say, for a month, uh, the, if you start with one kilo, in a month it could be... Uh, uh, half kilo in another month, or half kilo in the quarter, and it goes on like that. This carbon dating starts with a big assumption. We don't know the quantity we started with in, in amount. So we don't know the starting point in the carbon dating. And that's the really make the whole thing collapse immediately. No, but a carbon dating is only accurate for about 50,000 years. It cannot measure millions and millions of years. And we don't know the circumstances. We think that the carbon dating or the, this diminution of half-life is happening because we live under the atmosphere that we live in now. Go back before the flood. The situation was different. So it was not a consistent atmosphere from the creation to this point to be able to apply the carbon dating to the full stretch of time from creation to carbon dating now. And no one is actually now using carbon dating. They are shy from it completely. The modern books of evolution are shy because of the fallacies of carbon dating. And uh, there is uh, something called uh, St. Helen um, Mountain. She erupted in America near Seattle. And they took some of this lava from it and gave it to different laboratories, geology bowls, they dated them differently, with different of millions of years difference between all of them. So we should understand the geology of the, of the flood, which is a wonderful topic, to explain the world we live in now. I'll give you another example. When you look at the, the Bible speaks about the earth was one solid mass and the water around it. And then after the flood, there is continental shift. And if you look at Africa and America, North America, you find they are fitting really together. If you just bring them together, they fit. So how the science look at this? They measure the distance between, say, Morocco and, and America, and they say this is 3,000 miles, for example. And uh, the shift happens one meter every year, so that is 3 billion years ago. 
the calculation is not accurate. I'm not just, I'm just giving you the feeling of, of how we calculate these things. Then you come to something like tsunami. Full island moved in a few hours because of the floods that happened. Yeah? So you cannot measure the distance now and apply the rules now to something happened in the past because there were different conditions in the past. And because of that, you cannot come to a conclusion that this distance is such and such distance, therefore it must be millions of years. Yes? Why do you think Noah didn't take Pegasus in the ark? Oh, he did! He did! Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yes, I met him and I know. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Dinosaurs. Nashua and myself went to America to Creation Museum. And we spent the full week there. It's a wonderful place. And there is a big section about dinosaurs. And uh, we met the man who designed them as well. But he's not there. Right. And dinosaurs. The word dinosaur came by a chap called Richard Hull. said Hull in the 18th century, 19th century, 1830, to describe a big lizard with this huge big mammoth. So the word of dinosaur is not in the Bible, because it's the new word which he introduced in the 19th century. And the translation of the Bible to the English happened at King James' reign in 1611. So the word was not there. But the description of an animal similar to dinosaur, you find it in the book of Job. And God is saying, I made this animal when I made you. In the sex, if you like. Yeah? So we come to that, but that's another issue itself. Back to your question. Dinosaurs hatch from an egg like the size of a football. So the small dinosaur will be like a little goat. Yeah? They can grow up like the elephant. It can be a small elephant and a big elephant. Yeah. So what happened is, God asked Noah to take two of all animals and seven from the clean animals. So probably there were dinosaurs who owned the ark. That's not a problem at all. What happened to the masses of dinosaurs who were outside the, the ark, they were caught in the flood. That's why we have the sediments of them. That's why we have the fossils of these dinosaurs. Yes, they died after the flood. Some majority died during the flood itself. And after the flood, we think, that's not 100% proven, there was an ice age. There was a big change of atmosphere after the flood because the flood geology has changed lots of things. So, lots of animals died at this particular period. That's why we have fossils of them, actually. Because they were buried immediately with separation of oxygen. That is essential. I well myself who were visiting China this year and... Um, one of the guys was saying, we are not going to open this tomb because if we allow oxygen to enter in, everything will decay. And we don't have the technology now to keep everything, so we are not opening it at all. So in order to have fossils, you need to separate oxygen completely. And for that, it's only the geology of the flood who allows that. But if you allow the animal to die and then uh, decay, you won't have a fossil. Yeah, that's very important. And they are not millions of years. That's right. No, I just uh, I remember a buddy of the guy who uh, uh, did the dinosaur and he just wrote the Do you want the microphone, Nashua? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so, that's he, right. He, he goes and he looks for fossils for dinosaurs and he said it's interesting when you cut the bone. I was asking questions to him about colors and shapes and how do we get the shape from and he was answering all these questions. But he said if you cut, sometimes you cut through the bone, you smell it. And there's red cells there. Which doesn't go to millions of years. And yeah. you said it's not a Exactly. And this is another <laughs> important issue that natural say near Saturn, they discovered some bones of dinosaurs and they found blood cells that grew the are blood cells. Blood cells doesn't live for millions and millions of years. It's only thousands of years. This research was published and oh they said, no 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 suppress that. There is lots actually well, would they say the word un I won't say corruption actually, but I said it now. Of, of data, of information. And that's why, do you remember the first verse I started with? Test everything. Yes, test the wrong data. Test everything and hold on to the truth. Hold on to the good. 
Nothing wrong of testing everything. But be careful. Not everything written in science magazines is absolutely right. Not at all. Not everything written in the newspaper is right. They say, you know, we found uh, the ancestor of man, the common ancestor Lucy, and they call her Lucy, by the way. Um, and then, after a few weeks, you find a small little line, this was not really true. So they pick a big headline, but when it is not true, they nullify it in a very small sentence. Test everything, hold on to the good. So as a Christian, you are open-minded, and you should tackle these things. And nothing wrong of, of discussing all of these issues. I'm delighted by your questions, and the level of intelligence here is amazing, Abuna. So, <laughs> I don't know how you cope with all this group, but it's great, God bless you. Yeah. You're in Yeah. So, yes. Sorry, there's a question here, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, you know the thing you said about God being outside the solar system? Yeah. Um, how can you, like, you use that in an argument with an evolutionist? Because is that not kind of your assumption? Or yes. Is something in the Bible? Wonderful, yes. Again, that's a wonderful question. You did the question. Yes. The question is, how can you use the argument of God is outside time with an evolutionist? Okay. Um, because he would say you, you are giving me an assumption rather than a fact. That's a very good question. My answer to this is, <coughs> give me your theory of evolutionist. You started with nothing and nothing has exploded. And that's completely illogical. Yeah? I have to come to a point in the discussion and say, let us go to the word of God. And the Word of God is the good starting point. <coughs> then you will say, I don't believe that the Bible is true. That's great. Because I can prove that the Bible is true. I have the Dead Sea Scrolls, I have the geology record, I have the history record, I have... We are celebrating Christmas because Jesus divided the history before and after. No other event divided the history like that. Imagine the birth of a baby makes the history before him and after him. I was speaking in one of the schools yesterday and they had a PowerPoint presentation of great events that happened in the man history. Like man landing in the moon. Wow, that's a great event. But it didn't divide history before and after. And I put the date, not everybody remember the date. Uh, electricity. We can't really survive without electricity. Uh, something like antibiotics, uh, Alexander Fleming in 1945. That has transformed our life. And the medicine and surgery and everything because of our antibiotics. Um, things like telephones, uh, a great bell. Uh, I showed them the first telephone, which is bulky. And I showed them the mobile now like this. Uh, all these events are great, but it didn't divide the history before and after. The birth of Christ did. So I can prove that the Bible is a true book. And the Bible tells me about God. Because I can't find God by my own. He has to reveal himself. Because God is a spirit. And the definition of God as a spirit is not limited by the material things. And the other thing, if you take it more deeper, if he doesn't agree with all of that, that's his problem, but I'll take them deeper. There is difference between information and material. And that's a lovely discussion. Information has no weight. So if I have my disk here and full it fill it with information. And weigh an empty disk and the disk full of information, the weight is the same. Yeah? But they have loads of information on one disk and an empty disk. So information has no weight. It's not material. It's spiritual. Well, not spiritual, but it's not material. Yeah? So God, not, God is not a material, so I can't apply the rules of material to Him. If the evolutionists can give me an answer to how these molecules bumped each other and formed a cell, I'll start to listen to him. But before he does that, I won't accept his point. So we have to have a starting point. And my starting point as a Christian is the Bible, and I can prove it is true book. We cannot start by saying, okay, we come from neutral ground, because these evolutionists come with loads of assumptions. 
Us, we need to accept that. And they won't. That's right. I'm just saying that the debate is for us to give an answer when they ask us, but uh, God's Spirit, as you said, he reveals. So you're yeah. not changing him by this. But the other thing is, what is more logic? If you see a nice car, and you say, oh, wow, look at this car, there must have been an explosion in the factory. <laughs> to produce this car. <laughs> yes. That's completely logical. Yeah? But, but, but I had this question actually from one of my colleagues. From an atheist who said you are putting an assumption and, and that was my answer to you. Great. Are we ready for a break? There's a question. Yes, by the way. Do you believe that there's no more planet of life? Sorry, sorry? Do you believe that then there's no more planet of life on it? Right. And from the declaration of what they have is life is created on Earth. Other planets, I don't know about them because God did not declare that. At the moment, the solar system, we think the only life is on Earth. But people are very funny actually because they accept flood coming from Mars to the Earth and not accepting Noah's flood. And there is no drop of water in Mars. But they can accept the theory of flood coming from Mars to us here, but they don't accept that the word of God about Thomas flood. So I can't, the answer to your question, I can't comment on other planets because I don't know, I know that knows. But I believe that the human life was created in Earth. Do you know there is a big problem with other religions because they believe Adam and Eve were created in heaven, and then when they fall in, God brought them to Earth. This is a massive problem here. Because we are created in Earth, the atmosphere is adjusted, the oxygen we breathe is adjusted, the temperature is adjusted, the gravity is adjusted to give us weight. So we cannot be created in heaven and brought in our, on Earth. And God raised us from the dust of the Earth. And there is no dust in heaven. So, we are created on this planet, to live on this planet. You see the astronauts when they go outside, they wear these funny suits, yeah? To adjust the temperature and all, and all of that. And when they land here, the, the gravity is completely different to them, so they have to be adjusted, and lots of things have to happen for them to acclimatize again to the atmosphere. So we are created on Earth, God created life on Earth. Human beings are not descendants of apes, as we will find out later on the day. And uh, that's why we are created, the image of God, that's why God is the Creator and God is the Redeemer. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us to be the Savior. And that's why I believe in a Savior. And that's why I'm a Christian. So it's all linked and all very important. Your questions are wonderful. Really wonderful. And I haven't touched on lots of things. <laughs> if you have enough patience and power to continue the day, you will find more and more and more. Right, any, any more questions at this stage? What do you think about?